Oh, yeah. <laughs> how you doing, Cece? Good, Jim. How are you? I'm okay. Well, you know how I'm doing. You've been with me all day. Yeah, it's yeah. been a pretty uh, mm-hmm. chill Sunday. Yeah, it's been really nice. So um, we're cat sitting, and so yeah. the cat might get bored and then decide to enter the room, and she will be very vocal. So if you hear some meowing, that's... That's the cat, a beautiful creature named Lucy. A beautiful Persian kitty. Mm -hmm. And there's cat hair everywhere. There's cat hair everywhere. It's floating in the air. Floating in the air. There's cat hair everywhere. (laughs) What movie did we watch? (laughs) We watched um, Pink Floyd's The Wall. Yes, which is a 1982 movie based on a Mm -hmm. 1979 classic album by Mm. Pink Floyd of the same name. So the album came out first. The album came out three years first, yeah. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And you you were like a lifelong Pink Floyd fan. Yeah. Pink Floyd is my favorite band. Yes, I I, I was going to say that, and then I had a, a small doubt in my head. No, you're so, right. Yeah. And and it's been that way since I think I was 16 or 17 years old. Mm. The first time I heard Dark Side of the Moon, mm. my friend Ty played it for me and my friend Scott on mm. his parents' turntable when his mm. parents were out of town. He mm. turned off all the lights mm-hmm. and said, because I was all into Led Zeppelin. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you got to hear Dark Side of the Moon. Uh-huh. And so I did. And we played it from beginning to end in his parents' living room on their hi-fi system mm. uh, on vinyl. And I thought okay, my world is completely different now. Oh, really? Yeah. And this was after you had seen The Wall? No, no. See, before? I had never okay, seen okay. it before. Yeah, yeah. I'd never been introduced to Pink Floyd before. Mm. But they became my favorite band when I was, yeah, I think 17. See, I think I'm having that experience now because mm. I never thought, I never gave Pink Floyd a thought, mm. you know, because this movie came out before I was born. Right. I mean, I, I'd seen the uh, We Don't Need No mm-hmm. Education video mm-hmm. like a number of times, and yeah. I thought that was Pink Floyd. You know, that represented yeah. Yeah. everything I knew about Pink Floyd. And I have to admit, I never would have seen this movie on my own, on my own accord, if, I hadn't, if it hadn't been for you. Mm. Well, what have I done to you? Well, I mean, I think, you know, at this point in my life, I'm not as impressionable as I used to be when I was like 14. Yeah. And so Me too. I pretty much know what I like and what I, you know, I'm set in my ways kind of mm-hmm, thing, which yeah. is kind Me of too. unfortunate because I think I would have really gotten into Pink Floyd. Mm-hmm. And I, I hate to blame it on my age, but I just feel like I don't feel like I'm able to be into something the same way that I used to be. Mm-hmm. It's very sad. Well, you know, your taste in music kind of come mm-hmm. around early, I think. Yeah. And your early loves kind of dictate, you know, what's to come later. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's hard to jump in and, you know, after you've already decided what your tastes are, mm-hmm. and then and then suddenly something mm-hmm. turns you around. Mm-hmm. You know, it was that way with me with hip hop. I never got into yeah. it. Um, I was a Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, 70s, mm-hmm. prog, and, you know, mm-hmm. 80s. Which is like so not hip hop. And then, yeah. 90, then in the 90s, it was it was all kind of grunge and brit pop mm-hmm. and singer songwriter and folk mm-hmm. music for me but that being said yeah this was i said genius you, you did know? say that yeah i think i think the music the whole movie mm-hmm. was a work of genius i kind of feel the same actually mm-hmm. and it's funny because i hadn't seen this movie in years and years mm-hmm. and years so i'm seeing this now much later mm-hmm. and i was very impressed by this I mean, movie it was incredible it sounds fantastic mm-hmm. The music mix, which doesn't always happen in, in the movies. The very first first bass line. Yeah. Um, you came really out, hear the bass. And I was like, wow, it's like they're right in front of us. Yeah, it sounded like it was right in our face. Why doesn't music sound like that anymore? You know, I was thinking about this while we were watching the mm-hmm. movie because if you notice the thing about Pink Floyd, is there's four band members. Mm-hmm. And this was before the age when music started to get caked, you know, like synthesizers and samplers and machines. Mm-hmm. And rhythms started just kind of layering and layering and layering and layering. This is a band that has drums, bass, Mm -hmm. guitar, and Mm -hmm. keyboards with some orchestration. Mm -hmm. But you hear every instrument really clearly and Mm -hmm. you hear the singing really clearly. And there's these really silent spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's space in the music. And I think that's part of it is that you really just hear every instrument and it sounds really good together. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that. It's also just... 
I think the production is different. It was an analog era and everything kind of has that analog warmth and smear. Mm -hmm. Warmth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so especially with bass, because not to get too nerdy, but bass frequencies are these really slow waveforms. And when you digitize, Mm -hmm. when that comes through digitally, Mm -hmm. it just doesn't sound as good. Yeah. And now if you want to hear that kind of thing, you need to go see a band live. Mm Mm-hmm. If they yeah. can even play like that, <laughs> right? Because that's all going through, yeah, yeah actual circuitry. Yeah, but I, but you know, I've heard music like that. Obviously, mm-hmm. I mean, I've been around bass players. You know, yeah, you have. So I immediately recognized that sound. It was like, oh, it's like they're right in front of me. It's like mm-hmm. we're in the same room. So I like, well, how old were you when you saw this? So yeah, this was time? this was. At, I mean, I wasn't around for this time in Pink Floyd. Mm-hmm. I got into Pink Floyd when they had broken up. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I can give a little background on Pink Floyd mm-hmm. for people listening. You know, they had this early psychedelic period, mm-hmm. and then they had this singer named Sid Barrett, mm-hmm. and he was the writer, the singer, and the guitar player. And Roger Waters was just the bass player, and mm-hmm. you know, didn't write very much. Mm-hmm. And then they had Rick Wright and Nick Mason. Sid Barrett went crazy. He took too much LSD or something, or he, and you know, combined with psychological problems and things mm-hmm. like that, and he went nuts and they had to get another guitar player in named David Gilmour. So there was a brief period where there were two guitar players and they had to kind of cover for Sid's craziness on stage. Mm-hmm. And then he finally, he had to leave the band and he retreated to his mother's home and the band went on and they got out of this psychedelic period and went into this kind of late sixties, early seventies experimental period where mm-hmm. they did this kind of experimental rock. And then they made this album, Dark Side of the Moon, Mm. and it just rocketed them to superstardom. Mm. And then they, you know, so that was a collaborative time. They made Wish You Were Here, and then they made Animals, which is my favorite album of theirs. Mm. And then they made The Wall. So each, like each album is like a different novel. It's kind of different. It's similar subject matter. Yeah. Then after The Wall and after the movie, they made an album called The Final Cut, Mm. which is also one of my favorite albums by Pink Floyd. Mm. It's famous for being the end of the band, the final cut. Mm. Uh, And they had kicked Rick Wright out of the band, Mm -hmm. or Roger had kicked him out of the band. And so the band was no more. So by the time I got into them, there was no band. Okay. And then what happened is David Gilmour put together like this zombie version of Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. And I was excited at first, but... To me, Roger Waters is pink. Yeah, and Roger Ro- Waters feels very strongly about that, apparently. Yes, he does. And they're he's, still feuding over it. They're still feuding. Yeah, there's, we, we actually, pre- preparing for this, we watched um, the Live at Pompeii uh-huh. movie. Uh-huh. And then we watched some videos of uh-huh. Roger uh-huh. ranting. Yeah. And uh, he's like eight, he's in his 80s. Yeah. And he looks great. Yeah, he looks he's fantastic. Of you know, sound, mind, and body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's still being really petty. Yeah. Holy, I don't know if it's petty, though. And Dave is, too. Yeah. They just have this ego thing, a mm-hmm. power over the band. I guess if you've... Got, I mean, it's this corporation that's worth yeah, enormous totally. amounts yeah, yeah, of money, and yeah. they're battling for power over yeah. it. And but apparently, according to the, the articles I read, it's not even about the money anymore because they turned down money. Both of them have turned down money. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly Roger Waters has okay. turned down a lot of wa- uh, money mm-hmm. because he didn't want to play with, he didn't want to cooperate with mm-hmm. David Gilmore. Yeah. David Gilmore is more about the money, according to what I've read. Yeah. But it goes back to what I was saying during our David Grohl movie mm-hmm. episode where yeah. Rock and Rollers don't Stu- seem to age yeah like they are they remain kind of kids kids mm-hmm. um so they're in their minds they're just they're still like <laughs> they're still fighting over the old battles yeah yeah the old ego yeah, it's kind of cute yeah. stuff yeah i did this i did that but the reason i asked you how old you were when you watched this oh which you still have an answer okay so i would say yeah, showing my age here. I was when I got into Pink Floyd. That was like 1986. Mm-hmm. So this is three years after the final cut. Mm-hmm. And David Gilmour and Roger Waters had put out their own solo albums. And right before mm-hmm. David Gilmour's zombie version of Pink Floyd, mm-hmm. which was 1987. Okay. So I got into them in 1986. And at that age, I was 17 years old. Oh, because the reason I asked you that is because. Um, I could see teenage Jim Bacho being completely blown away yeah. by this. Yeah. And then I think this completely shaped who you are today. I think I was realizing this a little <laughs> bit watching it 
just today because <laughs> there's a lot of my attitude still in oh there. Oh my God. Yeah. It's totally you. And I was like, the whole time I was like, well, yeah, this is everything that if I had to sum you up in one oh, <laughs> movie, it would that's, be That's some pretty dark <laughs> shit. That's some pretty dark <laughs> shit. So can I ask what are some of the, because let's get into the movie. There's, it's mm-hmm. basically, I mean, it's a movie about a rock star. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's a movie about music. And we get to see his childhood. We yes. get to see him growing up. He loses his father. He mm-hmm. has this very odd relationship with it, probably too close relationship with his mother. Mm-hmm. He has a wife that he's not paying attention to, that he married, I guess, before his stardom. Mm-hmm. And then as he's a star, it's broken apart. Mm-hmm. And he's slowly going crazy. Mm-hmm. And his craziness is bringing out these fascist tendencies. Mm-hmm. And he, he eventually turns over to this completely fascist personality. Mm. So he becomes the leader of some sort of fascist movement. It's Yeah, it, so the whole thing is one of the beauties of the film is we're not quite sure what's right. what's fantasy right, and what's right. in his mind right. and what's being played out actually because yeah, he yeah. says, yeah. you know, like he says Pink's back at the hotel mm-hmm. and they sent us along as a surrogate band. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they're marching through the streets and attacking people and mm-hmm. Some pretty dramatic and heavy scenes of pulling, um, you know, black people out of their homes, pulling, you know, it looks like maybe a Turkish family out mm-hmm. of their home. And they find a white woman and a black man in a car making out. They beat the black man and they rape the woman. I mean, some pretty intense. Mm-hmm. And this is like, you know, the black shirts or the brown shirts, you know, going from door to door. Mm-hmm. So it's it's very much this this Nazi right. persona that he's taken on. Mm-hmm. For Roger, this is a metaphor, obviously. Obviously, yeah. The origin, I mean, Pink Floyd fans already know this, but there was the origin of this album mm. is during the Animals tour in 1977, 60, 76, 77, 78. They used to tour before they would record the album. So it probably was 76. Is Animal like an Orwellian? Yeah, so Animals okay. is yeah. like a like an allegory okay. based on George yeah. Orwell. They were doing the tour, and by this time they were playing in front of 70,000 people mm. in you know stadiums. And they were playing a show... And there was this kind of, I think, a chain link fence that's set up to keep the band, to keep the crowd away from the band. Mm -hmm. And they're playing, and Roger notices that these people are being smooshed up against this chain link fence. And Uh he's like, oh my God. Yeah. And, you know, they're trying to play these mellow freaking tunes, and people are going, people are going bonkers. But, what shocked him is what he did. Mm-hmm. He spat on the person. Mm. Oh, he himself. Oh, okay, he did. Okay. Like yeah. in real life. Okay. Yeah. So he started seeing people as like these animals mm-hmm. at, at the show. Oh. And like this dehuman dehumanization of all of these people who were just kind of these crazy fans. I could totally see that. And he's yeah. like, this is like a weird kind of cult thing. I yeah. I could totally control these people. Yeah. I could do violence on these people. Yeah. And then that's where the nothing face kind mm. of idea comes from. So this fascist idea starts to take shape. And it really, you know, you could interpret it in different ways. And Roger has never really, I don't think, fully explained the story. And I like it that way. Mm. But it's this allegory for, you know, kind of the dehumanization that happens with a cult-like totally. kind of existence. Yeah, and the people, the, a certain, like a mass that just follows exactly someone or something, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's the, the, the system or mm-hmm. rules or the government. You, know? you can see how yeah. it would happen. Because yeah. at one point, like in the We Don't Need No Education video, mm-hmm. There were these faceless um, kids who were turned into sausages, yeah. right? Who mm-hmm. like go into the sausage making. Yeah, it's factory. the education process. Yeah, and then there was the same process kind of hinted at the same process at the cult, the the rally yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's rooted in the same human tendency that he finds kind of freaky. And I, I totally, I relate to that a lot. Not not that I ever thought that I could wield a cult, but <laughs> like I was talking about this this morning or yesterday where I never participated in some of the nationalist events that Korea <laughs> became famous for, mm-hmm. like the 2002 World Cup. Um, I've been yeah, very that's critical right. we were talking about, that. about that. Yeah, yeah, I've been very critical about it. It really freaked me out, to be mm-hmm. honest. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that, I don't think of it as a positive. You know, me it's too. Just, yeah, it's just something that really freaked me out a yeah. lot. And I could totally imagine being a rock star and seeing the crowd behave in that way. 
and having contempt towards them. Yeah, you can see how power works yeah. because you have total control over these yeah. people. Yeah, I never got into the nationalist thing. I, I'm not nationalist at all. Me neither. I have um, no whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. I mean, I believe in things, but I've yeah. never, I've never been able to give myself over to like a this is the good of the Something state or this is Something as arbitrary the... as a country, I yeah. have never been able to right. fall, get behind that. That's right. so arbitrary. It's just completely nonsense. Yeah. It's a different age too. I think um, as we move further and further away from, for example, you know, World War II, which is depicted in this film, yes, um, that helps to boost nationalism. And so that mm-hmm. element is woven into the mm-hmm. film as well. I, I think generations, you know, now, like people now, it's, it's so separated from... Um, this kind of universal fight, mm-hmm. you know, of, of a nation. Mm-hmm. But even with, you know, things like the Iraq war, I was like, no, th- no, this is a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. But people get wrapped up in it. Yeah. So that's kind of one theme. That's, that's mm-hmm. you know, there's the rock and roll element and that plays mm-hmm. out. There's, and it, there's parallels with World War II and the loss of his mm-hmm. father. And then there's the personal psychic elements going on in his mind of his relationship with his mother Mm -hmm. and his inability to show affection to his wife. Yeah. Also the element of drugs, alcohol, abuse, violence. Mm -hmm. It's really a man who's yeah, going insane. Yeah, it was very Freudian too at times. Very. Yeah. Yeah. And there was an animation. There were several several animation animations. sequences by Brilliant. Gerald Gerald Scarf. He's an English political cartoonist. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they they kept showing this flower that would turn into a serpent sometimes and then sometimes a scorpion. Like it would morph into different things and it looked like a vagina. Well, that was his wife. So the flower, yeah. <laughs> the flower that attracts you mm-hmm. and then, you know, becomes a vagina mm-hmm. and then the swallows vagina you, yeah. at- sw- attracts you and then swallows you and eats you alive, mm-hmm. becomes a scorpion. Mm-hmm. He had some pretty... Yeah, or a serpent or some sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's pretty twisted. Yeah, and then it would morph into like a a shape that kind of looked like a woman's body, mm-hmm. and then it would go back to being like a one of those carnivorous plants. Yeah, yeah, right. But it started off as a flower, but it immediately looks like a vagina as mm-hmm. soon as it opens up its petals. It's like, oh, vagina. Mm-hmm. That was interesting. I was I was like, well, I wonder what that's all about. But you know, whatever. Okay. Well, I, I think yeah. that's Roger's look mm-hmm. on the process of love and marriage is mm-hmm. you know at first you know you're allured and then you know it, it's it's you could say it's misogynistic i don't think sense. it's misogynistic but this you mentioned this sometimes and i think you're right about it i think there's something about the man who's pursuing his art mm-hmm. um feeling terrified that he might be entrapped into a marriage and a family life yeah, we so talked that about he, that with The Shining, the movie The Shining. You always talk about this and i think like <laughs> Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think that that's somewhere buried in your psyche, and that's why you didn't get married for as long as you did. It may be true, yeah. yeah. And and why it took me, yeah, this long like to, 50 years. to find a woman who's an artist, you know, who understands <laughs> the artistic process. <laughs> but I'm also not dependent on you, and we're not yeah. going to have like a family in the classic sense of right. the term family. But I think there's this, again, post-World War II mentality of like being, you know, the artist versus the family man. Mm-hmm. And those two things True. kind of being... Yeah, in. they were in conflict, uh, mm-hmm. um, I think. And it's less a thing now. Yeah, yeah it's, now there it's more like partnerships and, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I think back then that was a, a reoccurring theme in these movies like true yeah art very, in yeah. brilliant men like novels mm-hmm. brilliant men mm-hmm. often wrote about the, these kind of things mm-hmm. um well the shining is one of them yeah it is yeah, it for totally sure. is. yeah i heard that the i heard that misery is one of them too <laughs> it's like a, oh that's weird yeah so misery Being stuck yeah represents the family <laughs> yeah because she won't yeah. let him go <laughs> yeah and and also she won't um he has to produce in order to survive, but for oh, somebody else, yeah, you know, yeah. like oh, you know, yeah. being the provider. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's easy for me into 2022 to be like, well, <laughs> it's like straight men being taking themselves too seriously, or oh, that's misogynistic. But then I thought about it. I was like, that is a real pressure. Yeah, it is. In that context, in this historical context. This is why a lot of artists don't get married. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or philosophers. Yeah, and so they 
they end up, you know, and so when they, if you never have children and you just work for, you know, you just, you're buried in your work and mm-hmm. your art and mm-hmm. you're devoted to your craft, you end up leading a, a somewhat isolated lonely right. life and that's kind of the trade-off I right think. That and is. that's why i think a lot of these dudes went a little crazy yeah, yeah. and women too like mm-hmm. there's a certain it was directly in conflict with a lot of these brilliant women like mm-hmm. sylvia plath i was thinking yeah. of sylvia plath but yeah. it's kind of a different thing isn't it it's um it turns inward mm, yeah, um, yeah at least the, te- the the tendency in literature is right. that it turns inward and mm-hmm. it turns suicidal right yeah. Love is about music. Yeah, so those are some of the themes of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've seen this movie, you know, two dozen times. Mm-hmm. Again, Pink Floyd is my favorite band. Mm-hmm. And I lived with this album. So it's mm-hmm. interesting to, that you say, <laughs> that you see Oh, yeah, me it was a total Jim Batcho movie. Yeah. movie. Yeah. yeah. Everything that my husband talks about on a daily basis. So the, my political views, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Um, I'm resistant to any kind of uh, alliances, conform- yeah. conformity. Um, identity is a big thing. Yeah, identity like, is a big thing. Like yeah. to, um, I don't like this tribalism kind yeah, of thing yeah. that happens because it, I mean, I've also read Orwell, you know, like um, that was a big part of my youth too. Or, and Roger Waters appropriates Orwell mm. in, his, in his thinking. Mm. Um, it's this danger of kind of universal thought or kind of a group think. Right. And I think every artist is resistant to this. I mean, you're the same way. Yeah, I am the same. But mm-hmm. I think with the identity, politics, or whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. tribalism, I'm a little bit more sympathetic towards that than mm-hmm. you are, mm-hmm. I think, based on our I'm sympathetic to it. I don't like it when it becomes dogma. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm totally, I, I'm fine mm-hmm. with somebody, you know. Yeah, I, I know you are. Yeah. But it's, it's when it becomes weaponized as a kind of demand. Mm-hmm. that others change their entire belief systems to match yours. I don't think that... So, so that's where we differ. Mm-hmm. I don't think the request, the demand, is that everybody change their beliefs. I think the demand or the request is to be accepted just like they accept heteronormacy or the default like white privilege, mm-hmm. just like we've been... Not we, but like, you know, they, a certain group of people have been subjected to this mm-hmm. sort of default, you know, whatever. I think they are demanding the same sort of acceptance, mm-hmm. level of ac- acceptance. But that's just proving to be very hard because it's just really hardwired into our psyches. Yeah, I also think that it's it shows a lack of creativity in the strategies of bringing that about. Because well, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I think that what happens is that you set up an opposition where somebody is is going to it's almost like you're asking for mm-hmm. an oppositional relationship mm-hmm. yeah rather than a kind of a positive expression of mm-hmm. whoever or whatever and however you identify mm-hmm. it's that the other has to i mean there there are kind of mandates out there mm-hmm. of a demand for the majority to conform to these various groups mm-hmm. that people don't have any personal experience with. Mm. And so it all becomes just yeah. an exercise of language and symbols. Mm-hmm. And what people really care about is what's close to them mm-hmm. and what they can feel and what they understand. Mm. And that's what I mean by asking somebody to believe something other than what their experience is. Yeah. People, people know their experience. So mm-hmm. my thing with identity is I wish that people would express it in a way like this film, yeah, express yeah, it in metaphor, yeah. in allegory, yeah. in some kind of story or some kind of thing like that rather right. than this legalistic language mm. that is highly symbolic mm-hmm. where people don't have a tactile mm. sensory kind of connection to it i agree with you but i also think and this is i'm not opposing you i'm just right. adding on to yeah. you yeah that there is a sort of like resentful uh, there's a resentment that there's where, total yeah, resentment. there's a resentment where it's like we're going to just like we have been forced to think on your terms and mm-hmm. to accept things on your terms for like however long. Certain groups of people, certain you know identity groups. I don't mm-hmm. know how to yeah, say. Yeah, it. Yeah. I can't even talk anymore because it's so politically correct. It, I know. Yeah, it is. it's um, hard to talk about. I do kind of. I sympathize. Like I said, I sympathize yeah. too. But it becomes almost like a religious struggle. It's, it's yeah. It's, so it's going to be weird. Mm-hmm. For a while, I think this is a transition period yeah. of some sort. I think so too. I think yeah. you're right. And it's people really trying to wrap their psyches around 
technology mm-hmm. and and you know social media and things mm-hmm. like that that mm-hmm. where we're still not sure if it's you know if it's an act is, is social media an actual thing or is it entertainment mm-hmm. or is it yeah you know what what is it that we're doing with social media right. is it or is it are these real expressions well mm-hmm. our brain hasn't been able to adapt to that level of abstraction mm-hmm. and that's what i mean by the distancing mm-hmm. if you make these demands in this kind of cold distant way mm-hmm. on a legal basis or a mm-hmm. symbolic basis or a religious even mm-hmm. kind of an atheist religious sense mm-hmm. people aren't going to you can't expect people to conform i agree with mm-hmm. those tactics those tactics of opposition so here's a here's a film and an album that kind of deals with these issues in a narrative way and I think a creative way. Yeah, it was utter genius. It was not like, you know, I mean, I think it was just like, it doesn't really matter what you believe in Mm -hmm. or if you like it or not. Mm -hmm. For me, it's like, I don't even know if I, it's not a question of whether I liked it or not. Mm -hmm. It was just genius. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it doesn't really matter how I feel. It's not even a value judgment when I say it was genius. Mm-hmm. It's not even a value judgment. Are you talking about the music, the lyrics, the, the filmmaking? Everything. The writing? Yeah. yeah. It was just a complete... Um, there's this Korean word that... And I can't think of an equivalent in um, mm. English, but when we talk about work, especially music, critics use this word wansongdo a lot. And it's the literal translation is the complacency of an album, like how complete, mm. how complete it feels. So how thoroughly completed it was. And that is a concept that I totally understand mm-hmm. when I watch these things and when I listen to rock and roll albums, mm-hmm. because there is so much work put into it mm-hmm. that you could hear and see Yeah, true. that there's so like you know you could tell that somebody put in just sold their soul Mm -hmm. to make this kind of thing and you know what the critics in korea don't really use that word anymore i i Mm. noticed that they use that word less and less because no but nothing nobody's doing that (laughs) sounds like it has you know been made with a lot of thought and effort and well there's probably underground and alternative definitely yeah Yeah. but it's hard to do that like if you have like a full-time job Mm -hmm. and you don't have a label backing you up it's not the same as Mm -hmm. when because i remember when a lot of music used to be like this there was a lot of not like that but there was a lot there were a lot of albums that i was like oh this is genius Mm -hmm. you know yeah this is amazing Mm -hmm. this is incredible Mm-hmm. Now it's like, yeah, it's all right. You yeah, know? I, d- I don't. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to sound like the old man, but I, I don't think that people are making music like this anymore. That there's that period of Pink Floyd from, let's say, Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall, and The Final Cut, and I would say those are the five great Pink Floyd albums. Mm-hmm. All each one of them is like a novel, mm-hmm. and each one has, and this is what I think is missing. Each one of them has a world in which you can fall into yeah, and live yeah, inside of. Yeah. And there are different themes that, you know, Dark Side of the Moon is about kind of this inner, a lot of it is influence, Roger's thinking about his old friend, Sid Barrett, who went crazy. So mm-hmm. it informs a lot of his lyrics. But Dark Side of the Moon is about the inner psyche and kind of humanity and what are we doing as human beings. Wish You Were Here is about fame and stardom and that sort of thing. And then Animals is this total Orwellian Mm -hmm. dystopia with Mm -hmm. some of the greatest guitar solos you'll ever hear in your life. It's just a beautifully dark recorded album. And then The Wall is what we've talked about. And the final cut is about war. Mm-hmm. It's it's about war and the and the problems of war. It goes back to World War II and the death of his father, but it also goes to the Falkland Islands war. Um, it's a, it's scathing against Margaret mm-hmm. Thatcher, who was mm-hmm. in power at the time. Um, so each one of these albums is just this world that you can live inside of, and and there's meticulous care taken mm-hmm. in the production. And and even though Roger Waters had seized power in terms of writing more and more with each album. David Gilmour is also producing the albums. Mm -hmm. People forget that. I'm totally Team Roger because he's the writer. Mm -hmm. I don't think Pink Floyd should have used the name without him. But Oh, whoever, he who writes. Yeah, I think, exactly, I I feel the same way. So I wonder, like the genius you're talking about, I do think of Roger in that way. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the screenplay to the movie. So he wrote the album. Interesting fact, actually, (laughs) Roger had so many ideas that... Mm -hmm after Animals, they were going to record the new album. And he had two albums that he presented to the band. Mm -hmm. He said, I've got this one project (laughs) called The Wall. It's done, pretty much. 
And you know, this is imagine the band members coming in for yeah. the meeting. What are we going to do the next album? I got this one album. It's I've already got it all written. It's done. Pretty but much. Pretty that's much. That's the definition of a genius to me. But then the thing is, yeah. he said, or. Yeah. I got this other album that exactly. I completely wrote. Do you want to do that album? Yeah. And they voted and they decided on the wall. Mm-hmm. The, the other one is his first, became Roger Waters' first solo album, okay. Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, yeah. which is a fantastic album. Um, so he brought these two mm-hmm. <laughs> albums um, to the band and they're like, oh, let's do this one. Because the, the, the definition, one of the things about these genius artists is the relentless need to express oneself Mm -hmm. like the relentless it's just like you never give up kind of thing and it's just like sort of like a it's not even about a work ethic it's Mm -hmm. just a kind of ocd thing right Uh, that they let they have to let it out and so going back to what i was saying earlier i mean i'm sure i know there's good music out there i love you know this band called hiatus coyote Mm. they have great albums they have very very full sounds and great lyrics you know there are there is good music out there yeah i agree and i still buy music and i th- there is music that i love but but right. not there's but, not a lot of rock music that but i love but it anymore. doesn't sound it doesn't feel like it, not the great music out there and the skilled musicians out there are definitely and, and musicians are more skilled than ever i think in i, a I lot agree of ways, yeah. i agree they're they're better than ever but nothing since in the past 20 years or so feels like epic poetry yeah exactly yeah no but seriously and and this felt like this kind of brought me back it to is it's it. like yeah. epic poetry yeah. you're right it is like a um yeah a full epic it has an it has a narrative arc mm-hmm. i mean this was a lot of this was happening in the 70s too which is um the concept album mm-hmm. which is um you know these very progressive bands mm-hmm. would make these concept albums some of them were some of them were utter shit mm-hmm. and some of them were sheer brilliance mm-hmm. it's usually one person in the band taking control of the situation mm-hmm. either lyrically or the whole thing mm-hmm. and yeah and running with it and then the rest of the band you know kind of saying okay you got yeah. <laughs> i see you've got this idea right. we'll go along with this mm-hmm. but yeah i don't think that i don't I don't find that happening these days unless there's irony. I mean, it seems mm-hmm. like there's there's not a lot of sincerity. And for me, the music I love, from, the reason why I still love music from the 70s is the sincerity of the concept, of the idea, of the world, of this entire world being built. Mm-hmm. And then just this glorious music that's... Mm-hmm. That's inside of it, and this incredibly complex music. I just, yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting you say, yeah, the epic, the epic poem. I think like Kendrick Lamar comes to mind for me. Like I feel like he he he's had mm-hmm. albums with this kind of like his own world, and he's said he just things. came out with a new album. I yeah, think. I heard about it. I haven't heard the the album. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that this is his album. This is his response to a lot of the things that have been going on these past couple of years, mm-hmm. including Black Lives Matter, because he was notoriously silent okay. during... Well, he's a pretty reclusive guy anyway, he's right? Very, yeah, he's very yeah. private. But, you know, there are a lot of people who look up to him almost like a... In a, a he's like a messiah, you know? <laughs> a prophet. Yeah, mm-hmm. he has, that kind, he has yeah. that kind of thing. But everybody else, I don't know, like, I can't really think of anybody else. Yeah, um, I can't either. yeah. And I'm I'm starting to wonder, is it just sort of, I I think it's the music industry and how they operate that Mm kind of killed that. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people who potentially had, you know, who would have been potentially the next Roger Waters or Kurt Cobain's or, you know, Mm -hmm. Freddie Mercury's. But I just don't think that in the world of streaming platforms and YouTube. Yes. (laughs) Well, the attention is at a a different level. At a different state. I just thought of this just now while you were mm-hmm. while I was listening to you. But maybe it's that there's a split that that the that the the budget and the you know the high let's say the high level recordings are very corporate and very driven. You know you have to recoup that money. You have to recoup those costs. Mm-hmm. And so for that to happen, it has to be kind of a pop. It has to have wide appeal. And to do something, you know, in any art, you can't be appealing to mass appeal. It just doesn't work that way. So then there's that. But then on the other side, maybe there's um, this a kind of an indie kind of thing that's happening. But you don't have the... I don't know that musicians... I think that musicians are very skilled, but I don't think that you, you have a band. 
Well, yeah. I don't think that you have a band because everybody's right. got their own concerns yeah, going on. Yeah, because it's about survival now. Like, yeah. you know, in order for in order for a band to operate this way, to create epic poetry, as I said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there needs to be a label backing them up. That's, they have that was to, what, that's yeah, what I said. That they really, they can't just have these like part-time jobs as baristas mm-hmm. and supporting themselves and then cranking out albums right. in their garage anymore. Like, right. that's just not a thing. And there's nowhere to play. And there's nowhere to play, yeah. Yeah, and you got to, like, sell your own merch. you got to, like... The reason Kendrick Lamar became Kendrick Lamar was because Dr. Dre backed him up and said, hey, do yeah. whatever you want. Right. There needs to be some sort of, like, support system mm-hmm. for this kind of thing. Yeah, it, it was that way in the 70s. In the yeah. 70s, they, there would be... a Somebody would discover the band by hearing mm-hmm. them live and, and, and then basically represent them. Yeah, and there needs to be a trust towards yeah. this yeah, artist. Yeah, yeah. So it... it it takes a really charismatic, it takes a very, very special kind of artist to mm-hmm. be able to do this. Yeah. I think Taylor Swift is one of them, even though her music mm-hmm. is not at that level yeah, for, yeah, for me. Yeah. <laughs> I would say the band Tool, um, yeah, except yeah. that I haven't been too happy with, like I didn't I didn't like Tool's last album very much. Um, but they're still at least doing this high concept mm-hmm. kind of music. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can't really think of, of any others. Yeah, and then for me, it's like there are certain... Beyonce's sister makes great music mm. and she has creative freedom. She's creating art. You know, I, I can't say the same for Beyonce. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, her sister Solange is doing exactly what I was talking about earlier. But she kind of stays at an indie level kind of thing. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this is considered, apparently, she is considered a little bit independent, mm-hmm. even though the scale is massive. There are certain artists who are doing. You know, but then it's everything is it's like there are too many products. That's the other problem is there's too much music. Yeah. And you it doesn't create that kind of following Mm -hmm. and that momentum doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So the rock stardom doesn't happen. So the creativity doesn't happen. Yeah, because it takes years. No one's willing to kind of slave it out for two years or three years or four years or five years. That's another thing in this age of streaming apps and Mm -hmm. YouTube and social media success and failure is so different now like people Mm -hmm. view success as something entirely different right and success is so important now right whereas before i think you were just like i don't know if you were a musician you could if and your band didn't take off you could continue to play at like play gigs well in the 70s if if it didn't take off you'd start another band you would you would you would group with these other people who you Mm -hmm. met while you were touring and you would start a different band that happened all the time Mm -hmm. in the 70s until you got it right let's try to bring it back to the movie um let's think of it as a movie about music it unfortunately i think here's where it's not such a great film uh it it has a lot of the cliches of the guy tearing up the hotel room. Were they cliches back then, though? That's a good question. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that. Because when I was watching it, I I snorted a little bit. Like yeah. I was a bit like, meh, mm-hmm. at that scene. But then I was like, well, it was released in 1982, so was True. that a cliche back then? Yeah, maybe it wasn't. I mean, we heard. I mean, I read. I think the book's called Hammer of the Gods, the story mm-hmm. of Led Zeppelin, and they would tear up hotel rooms mm-hmm. and they lived the rock and roll lifestyle. But mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, maybe maybe it wasn't a cliche. Then. I mean, I you know, this is a genuine question because yeah. I wasn't around. <laughs> well, I wasn't around. I wasn't thinking about these things when I was, mm-hmm. you know, Four 14 years old, yeah. four, 14 years old yeah. in, in, I guess that's 82. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, with some slight exceptions, the album is pretty much the same as the movie. Mm-hmm. Like all the voices and things like that. Like the mm-hmm. girl who goes into the, it's re-recorded, but the girl mm-hmm. who goes into his trailer. Or a hotel. Or a hotel. Room, that, yeah, was, that was a weird, like a there was a discontinuity. Yeah. But I think it didn't matter. I yeah. think it was kind of opening yeah. and closing doors. Yeah, it's a different voice, but it's the same dialogue. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the dialogue is the same. A lot mm-hmm. of the sounds are the same. The, the teacher um, is there. We, didn't, we never hear the mother, except mm-hmm. for at the end. But yeah, it's pretty much the album. And then filmed, and Alan Parker, we should talk about Alan Parker. So he was a, he was a pretty well-regarded director. Mm-hmm. He made some great films. He made um, a film I really love called Birdie. Mm-hmm which is uh, a very young Nicolas Cage, mm. and he's fantastic in it, and Matthew Modine, mm. and Peter Gabriel did the soundtrack, mm. Midnight Express, Bugsy Malone. Oh, is that the movie with all the kids? Jodie um, Foster and all that? You're right. It's Jodie Foster, Scott Baio. He did Fame, which was a oh, huge hit. Oh, remember my name. I want to live forever. I want to learn how to fly. Fly! 
Uh, he did Angel Heart. Mm-hmm. He did Mississippi Burning, which is another highly regarded film. He did another movie we might do for the podcast mm-hmm. called The Commitments. Okay. He did Evita with Madonna. Oh, that's Alan Parker. Mm-hmm. I knew. I knew you'd know that. Yeah, I knew the name sounded familiar. Yeah. Okay, got it. And but this is very this is very different kind of film. I there's a story that I heard where they showed this at I think Cannes or some well-known film festival and Alan Parker was saying how he sat a couple rows behind Steven Spielberg Mm -hmm. and Steven Spielberg was sitting next to somebody. And then at the end of the movie, Mm -hmm. Steven Spielberg turned to the guy to his left and said, what the hell was that? (laughs) But I think in like a good way, like nobody had ever seen anything like this Yeah, I would imagine Steven Spielberg saying that in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, that it's highly symbolic. Mm -hmm. It's, you have to kind of watch it a few times or listen to the album a few times mm-hmm. to really get some of these references. Mm-hmm. The album's really fairly direct, I think. But the movie has a lot of visual symbolism. I mean, the Gerald Scarf stuff, that was actually those animations mm-hmm. are in the album sleeve. Oh. So it's already there. Okay. And some of the symbols, I think, like the hammers mm-hmm. was already there. Yeah, the hammers were great. Yeah, so it has this kind of rich imagery and it's making these kind of associations visually through cuts Mm -hmm. and things like that and that you've got these overlaps of memories which is i think so i don't know that anyone was doing that with you know the kid see you know engages with the adult version of himself and Mm -hmm. things like that and and it's just it's like a one big hallucination but then it's very creatively edited because you see the kid running through the football field Mm -hmm. and you don't know what he's doing cut away yeah and then you come back to it again cut away well eventually over time you learn that he found this rat and then he took care of this rat Mm -hmm. put it put his sweater on it the rat died he put his sweater on got a bad fever Mm -hmm. and then the feeling of that fever is holding comfortably numb when he's having his drug overdose yes yes. in the hotel room it's the same feeling so he's in his adult drug mm. overdose he's he remembers being the child who was sick but it's all done visually it's all you know nothing's explained that is totally the type of thing that i think about when i'm on drugs <laughs> like something totally random that happened during my childhood that sure. i totally forgot about. me too yeah yeah that that happens yeah. yeah because you're tapping into your unconscious mm. and you know there's other things like uh you know the symbol of the hammers is there's a, i i heard that there's this Chinese proverb that says the nail that stands out shall be hammered down. Yeah, I think it's a Japanese. Is well, it Jap- it's a, it, but it said a lot about Jap- Japanese society. Mm, okay. Yeah, but it might be. It's probably a Chinese proverb. Yeah, I think yeah. it is. But yeah, it's the it's the idea mm-hmm. of conformity, and you see them in total um, mm-hmm. unison. Mm-hmm. Um, you see that each one is its own hammer, but together they create mm-hmm. this cross. Mm-hmm. And so there's that. You know, a lot of, yeah, Nazi references and and Holocaust Mm -hmm. references. I'm missing so much, but there's just so much going on symbolically. What about the singing asshole with the scrotum? Yeah, Yeah. so the the judge, the one who's determining his Mm -hmm. sentence, is a screaming asshole with a scrotum. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of walks up to him and I think he shits on him because he's like... Pink is at the bottom of the well. He says that he's going to shit on him. Yeah, it fills me with the urge to defecate, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I should say, I don't know if we, me- I mentioned this to you, mm-hmm. but I don't know if we mentioned this on the pod, but the idea is that each one of, each one of these memories, each one of these traumas that he's been through, each mm-hmm. one of these difficulties, losing his father, his relationship with his mom, his relationship with his wife, you know, the rat, you mm-hmm. know, his drug problem, all of these things are bricks in the wall. And so he's building up this wall to protect himself, mm-hmm. to protect himself psychically from the outside world, which mm-hmm. is encroaching on him. Mm-hmm. And then the worst punishment he can get mm-hmm. is for the judge to tear down the wall. Yeah. And then he's completely exposed. Mm. And so that's a kind of a traumatic mm. outcome. But then, you know, you kind of feel the sense that, I mean, I don't know, you're left wondering what, what came after that. Like, is it therapeutic or is it suicide or is it total madness? You're never really clear what it is. Well, I, I feel like that scene, I, I was watching it and I was thinking during that entire number that it was genius because it was so universal. Mm. I mean, I don't know. I felt like that. Mm -hmm. It was a manifestation of my own anxiety. Well, I thought about you a couple of times. my worst Some of the things you've talked about. Especially during the asshole scene where Mm -hmm. (laughs) he was talking about exposing him. Yeah. And then the wall was like surrounding him. Well, it's universal because we all do this. We all create, we all build, this is what the Mm -hmm. psyche is. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into this, but one... (laughs) 
I, I thought of a metaphor of my, you know, my dad having Alzheimer's. Mm. And I remember thinking it's like, it's as if he had built up an entire fortress mm. of his persona. Mm. And then I was watching it crumble away yeah. like brick by brick. I wasn't mm. even thinking of the wall, but I mm. thought of this idea, mm. but that he didn't know that it was falling away brick by brick. Mm. And, you know, but we all do this. This is our programming. This is our mm. habits. This is what the language that other other people have given to us. You know, we don't have our own language. We get our language from other people. We get our morals from other people. Yes. All of this builds up the wall, you know, that we that we use to protect ourselves from people we love. Mm. You know, not only people we don't. Yeah. It's not only about strangers, but we do it with people we love. Mm. We build these these kind of foundations to protect ourselves. Mm. And so the judge says we're tearing that down. Mm. And then it's totally ambiguous. What what does it mean? What's the outcome of that? We don't get an answer, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So it could be therapeutic. It could be suicide. It could be total madness because I think he is mad. He's mm -hmm. completely mad at that time. But it's left kind of ambiguous as to whether there's a break. It's kind of like the, the Joker movie. A little bit. Yeah. A yeah. little bit. And he kind yeah. of looked like um, the Joker a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. I, the one, one of the faults I think in the film is Bob Geldof plays Pink. Mm -hmm. And Roger wanted to play Pink. And Alan Parker, I think, mm -hmm. said, no, we need somebody okay. else. Like a real actor, McActor. But he wasn't a real yeah, actor. Yeah, he wasn't, That's the thing. Yeah. He was the singer for the Boomtown Rats mm -hmm. at this time. And I read his autobiography, mm -hmm. Bob Geldof's, mm -hmm. and it was called Is That It? And he talked about his experience doing The Wall, and he hated it. He was completely miserable. He didn't want to do the movie. And his that. agent said... No, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. Come on. It's Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. And uh, he hated doing it. Yes, because a lot of times we end up working for our agents. Yes, that's true. <laughs> CC Kim. <laughs> but I thought his one great scene was at the end in the in the bathroom stall. I thought he uh, played that perfectly. I thought he was good. I, I mean, was, I, I don't... Was good. I can't imagine anybody else. That's probably why. I mean, you know, I haven't seen it mm. two dozen times, so... Right. Yeah, I guess he was fine. I don't like his voice. Oh, much. but he didn't use it that much. Twice. He in the in the two um what's called in the flesh. I think the reason you don't like him in this role is it's because it's not Roger. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. You're totally right. You just got me. <laughs> yeah, he was fine. He yeah. was fine. But but I agree with Alan Parker in a sense that it I don't think it would have worked if Roger played like himself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's probably true. I mean, I can imagine him doing it, but mm -hmm. I think it was probably Roger was he's he's an egomaniac. Yeah. And I mean that in the best way. He's just an artist. Um I don't think it would have I think it would would have gone worse. Yeah, I don't think I don't you know, I don't think it could it would have been like that Barbara Streisand movie. <laughs> What is it? A Star is Born. Yeah, which you know? is all, like all Barbara all the time. One person is doing too much. It's yeah. like too much of Barbara. Too much Barbara. That's yeah. what you said during that podcast. That it, it's, I, I love Barbara Streisand, but I don't need to see that much. Uh, not that much. Yeah. You know? And I think that could have happened if he had mm. played himself yeah. pink. Because right. he is pink, right? Well, no. That's oh. the thing. I mean, he is sort of imposing himself as pink. But then here's what happened is after the final cut, David Gilmore comes along and says, fuck you. Mm -hmm. And your ego. I know you think you're pink. Mm -hmm. You left the band. I'm going to put the band back together. Mm -hmm. It was shit. Mm -hmm. They made an album called Momentary Lapse of Reason, which is not a good album. Mm -hmm. It's kind. Of, it got all these songwriters from the outside, because obviously you don't have Roger Waters. Right. To make these kind of... What you hear in a Momentary Lapse of Reason is David Gilmour's production, which he did excellently mm -hmm. in Pink Floyd, and he deserves all the credit, without a songwriter. And David Gilmore can write songs. He, he wrote some really great songs, especially early in Pink Floyd, and mm -hmm. he's got two, three, four, I, there's three of his solo albums that I really, really like. Mm -hmm. He's great. I love him as a solo artist. Mm -hmm. So he can write. Mm -hmm. But with Pink Floyd, he, got, he did this writing by committee bullshit thing. Mm -hmm. Got a bunch of synthesizer players, caked it with production, mm -hmm. and it's just not very good. And it um, became like and it, and it sold... <laughs> Billions of copies. And I went to the tour with my sister, Catherine, in Santa Barbara. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. And I saw Corey Feldman there. Oh, that is the most 80s thing I've ever yeah. heard in my life. it was 1987 <laughs> or 88, something like that. We, we can't finish this discussion on the movie without saying that this is... May 23rd is the 40th anniversary of this film. Oh, And that's yeah. why we're doing this okay, right yeah, now. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That's so, why you wanted to do this. Let me 40th anniversary, which, yeah, okay, I'm almost 40, so okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the 40th anniversary of Pink Floyd the Wall. Oh, Mall. that is crazy. So we're 
finally playing like a gig. Oh, um, yeah. oh music is starting yeah. to starting to pick up. Mm-hmm. I will be well. I will be showcasing some of my compositions mm-hmm. at an event at a Liquid Arts event on May twenty eighth in Seoul. So if you would like to come, you should yeah um, check out the face. We will leave the the link to the event Mm -hmm. on the description so please check that out jim will be playing drums and and this is organized by kenneth may and grace yes my friend grace Mm -hmm. who has a bakery called baking business called golden cheese tart so Mm -hmm. she was um generous enough to um lend us her space yeah that's great yeah and you know it's just for me it's like totally promoting myself but i'm also really glad that there is something that's to promote. going on yeah because it's been so long yeah. and also it's spring and you know we don't really we can't we don't have to wear our masks outside oh, bless we could spill out into the street and mm-hmm. like kind of drink wine or whatever in our little paper mm-hmm. cups and mm-hmm. we can you guys can bring your pets mm-hmm. cuz grace is a dog you know, she mm-hmm. work. She volunteers as a at a dog mm-hmm. shelter. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so music is starting to come back. We got a couple wet. We got a wedding gig, and, yeah, and we've got a um, possible other gig that may not happen. Mm-hmm. So it, that's it's really reassuring. It I is. think there is a lot of um, hunger towards event. Like mm-hmm. I find myself wanting to go out. Yeah, you know? me too. I'm looking yeah. forward to playing again. So it'll be fun. So long, everybody. All right, Take bye-bye. care. Under the moonlight I'll sing you a song So you'd magically feel a lot less alone Hopefully they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Of heroes and poets and sadness and war of immeasurable pain, unconditional love Movies about music